So Rob, um, you know, perhaps we can think about resilience in terms of uh, an organisation, because uh, you stated um, a couple of years ago uh, that you would never fly again, and um, that certainly within transition created quite a debate at the time. So I think perhaps in terms of organisations and resilience and, and flying. Well, just one thing I wanted to pick up on was something that Patrick said about the, about sustainability and, and, and resilience. I think that sustainability, as I certainly understood it, being involved in these things for, for a long time, is kind of based on this idea of getting to a place where that we can sustain. It's like getting to a, and even in permaculture, permanent culture, you know, something which kind of can, can run on smoothly and definitely once we can get to that level where we can all manage. And I think the, the, the kind of scenario that, that Patrick's talking about there you know, in terms of climate change is really one of the reasons why resilience is such an important thing to add into our thinking about sustainability because that's not going to be what we get. We're going to get something which has, is not this way and that way and having that ability in there not to have our expectation of something smooth but something that's going to have those jolts and being knocked about is really, really important. Um, I was reminded of a, a while ago in the, in the last days of the, of the Labour government uh, who'd always been very dismissive of the idea of peak oil and their perspective was it's not going to be something we need to worry about until 2030, it's really not an issue. And they held an event uh, a couple of months before the election that was this kind of supposedly secret summit about what a government response to peak oil would look like. Although it wasn't very secret because it got leaked in the paper. But there were two of us invited from Transition Network to go to this thing. It was a, quite something. And it was all academics. There was about 30 people, academics, business people, and so on. Uh, and it was really interesting being there with the people from Department of Transport, the government people, people from DEC and DEFRA and stuff, that they had presentations from all the leading people about peak oil and had presentations from people on climate change. And when we got to do ours from Transition Network, we started out and talked about Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's five stages of grief and talked about how, uh, in effect, transition was people who'd gone through the bargaining and the anger and the denial and had actually gone into acceptance and were now doing stuff and so therefore were about five years ahead of government, actually. And, uh, and But it was so intriguing that those people who, who were actually in charge of the thing when it came to talking about solutions, the only thing anybody talked about was improved vehicle efficiency. <laughs> it was staggering. We were going, uh, food? <laughs> and that was all the people were talking about. I think organizationally, yeah, I think, you know, in, in, in Transition Network, we took a, a dis, well, we, we, we tried to have a thing about not flying, I don't fly. <clears throat> and it's been really interesting, that thing of trying to, uh, of actually when people get in touch and say, hi, we've got a conference on in Seattle. Uh, will you come speak at our conference? And you say no, uh, but we can do it by Skype or we can film a talk and send you the talk. And, uh, and actually how initially people have a bit of a double take and they're like, really? And then they try and kind of argue you that you should go. But it's really interesting the ones where, where you get asked to go and you say, I'm, I'd like, there was this thing somewhere in California where they wanted us to go for this award thing we got nominated for. And they said, will you come? And we said, no, we don't fly. And they said, but you're nominated for this thing. We said, well, we still don't fly. <laughs> we could do it by Skype. And they said, we don't know how to use Skype. <laughs> and we said, well, that's what we do. And they said, we'll get back to you. And then they rang us up two weeks later and said, all the finalists will be presenting by Skype. Uh, and actually, and you get that quite a lot. So, so, so you, 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 when you say that's how it is and it's not, we're not going to fly and we're not going to come there, uh, actually, sometimes, you know, you maybe so instead you film the talk, at the beginning you say the reason I'm not there is because we don't fly, and then people often, the feedback is, there was a big standing ovation after that bit, we had to pause the video before we moved on to the next bit, and, uh, and I think what Patrick says is really important, you know, I mean, I'm always amazed when I go to, we're getting a bit off resilience here, but I'm always amazed when I go to and meet climate scientists who are the people who, you know, even more than you know, Patrick and myself, who, who, who are in that climate science every day, who read the journals, who read the stuff about the East Siberian methane hydrates and all this kind of stuff, and then they fly all over the place. And the whole conference circuit, and the whole, well, I had to go fly to New York to deliver my paper and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, uh, and so I think it is, the, it, it, it's, um, that, the, the resilient side of that, I suppose, is that actually, do I feel the fact that I don't fly anymore has reduced my quality of life? The fact that I know I'm never going to go to the US because I get horribly seasick, uh, I'm only going to go to places I can get to on a train from here, does that make my life feel more or less resilient? Uh, it, uh, I think it's, it's improved my quality. I don't, can't think of anything that I've lost to do. 
If you have uh, if you have questions, put your hands up, and we'll uh, we'll, we'll engage uh, more of you in the, in the day. I'll come, I'll come to you in a minute. Um, one other thing, I heard uh, at the Green Gathering recently, uh, George Marshall, um, who's a journalist and, uh, from Coin, uh, he's not a journalist from Coin, he's a journalist from Coin, and um, he was uh, talking about um, how the Green movement in general has made um, Green issues and sustainability its own, as it were, um, which enables other people to say, well, it's their issue and therefore not ours. Is there, um, do you think there's a danger that we will do the same with resilience? Uh, I know I was at a meeting with our parish council a couple of years ago and they said, oh, Mike, yes, you're into sustainability, aren't you? As though somehow <laughs> <laughs> it was a sort of a hobby and, you know, it didn't really matter to anybody else. You know, is there this step? But, but, but that becomes, you know, if we take it as our issue, um, that then people can say, well, it's their issue and, and not ours. I think that's one of the dichotomies that, um, um, you know, is there a danger with that with resilience? You, you talked about it being... Um, um, a, a much um, more clearly defined um, thing that was harder to get away from what we were talking about? Uh, I don't think so because I think already resilience is something which, uh, which is talked about in a lot of those places. I think it's a much more useful much, it's a much more useful dialogue for building bridges with people who we may have struggled to up until now. I think in the same way that peak oil offers that sort of okay, so how would this place function if we didn't have any lorries coming in and out of it for three weeks, uh, is a very useful kind of a focus. I think in the same way resilience offers really good ways of building and having discussions with people who otherwise we wouldn't necessarily. Um, I think one of the big challenges that we face, and, and, the, and the term resilience kind of sort of um, lures us there as well, and I'm certainly guilty of this myself, is that it's very easy to kind of slip into the language of fear and kind of like as a last resort you end up, you've tried to persuade somebody by various different means, telling them how amazing it's going to be and then, then you end up always slipping back, or I do, um, slipping back into that, oh but, but we have to because you know, peak oil, climate change and, and so for me, it, and I'm telling myself this as much as everyone else, it's, you know, it's so much about us actually being sort of patient enough and doing the work to actually really capture the fact that these changes are really positive, you know, and really believing that, you know, really believing that actually these changes are, are, are for our benefit in and of themselves, you know, that of course they are really necessary and that there is going to come a time when we're not going to have a chance anyway. I'm doing it now already. I've slipped into that. <laughs> um, but, but, but I think for me that in terms of this sense of like people taking ownership over it, you know, people need to find it accessible. And so, you know, so for us to talk about resilience, I think, again, it, as I've said, it is this challenge of, of keeping it as positive as we can, but not compromising. I mean, you know, the way that Patrick just delivered that. I mean, I really admire, you know, people's um, un unapologetic, you know, kind of approach to saying that. And I bounce between the two. And I think that we all have a, a huge challenge, you know, any of us that are passionate and any of us that have have woken up and have that calling, then we have a huge challenge to learn how to communicate this in a way that it will meet people who are at very different places without alienating them and without triggering whatever emotion it is, the emotional stage that they're, you know, they're caught up in. And so for me, you know, this how we take that sense of ownership out as widely as possible so that it's not just seen to be our job to do that. Um, it has to be about framing it in ways that, that as many people as possible relate to, which has to be the positive. And, and you know, it, it's a term that, that I'm going to use that's bounced about a lot in kind of a very fluffy way. But I think we need to talk a lot more about love. You know, we need to talk a lot more about um, that being what's at the heart of what we're really doing. And at a transition conference, there was a, an open space session that is transition about resilience or love. And it was the most amazing discussion. And I think, you know, you, you need to, it's easy to get lost and think that we're talking about something very fluffy and, and you know, sort of heaven seeking. And that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about something very grounded that is ultimately about us creating a world where we, we just feel that we are surrounded by that love because we're connected, you know, that, that, that this resilient way of living is really connecting us with nature and with each other. Um, yeah, but I suppose my main message here is it's about this communication to not alienate people. Just, just one thing I wanted to say on that was, was, was I'd, I'd be a little bit wary with, with the thing when you're saying about waking up because I think there is, uh, the, one of the things for, for me with when you look at resilience is, is that actually s sometimes there's a tendency to think, well, you know, 
in this movement, or the environmental movement, or the transition, whatever, you know, they're the people who kind of get it, and all the people outside don't really get it somehow. And actually, one of the things about resilience, I find, you know, working in the community is actually there are groups in, in my community who have nothing to do with transition, who have no understanding of that, who actually are, are hugely effective in terms of the resilience of that place. You know, the, the idea that somehow the people who've kind of got transition are the people who are going to deliver resilience. I mean, actually, you know, you've got like the Rotary Club and the different things that go on in the community and all the different stuff. There's massive amounts of organisations, the WI, who, do, who actually, um, all those people who volunteer and put in massive amounts of time, and actually, in some aspects, are already doing more resilience than those of us who, who maybe think we are and who, who understand the bigger concepts. So I'd be a little bit wary with that. And resilience provides a really useful common language with those people, I think, as well. I'd like to address your point about the idea that we should keep resilience positive. I don't really think we need to do that. I think we just need to get real about it. Is that actually the, the conversations which are, you know which need to happen are about um, being prepared, and they you know they're, they're, a lot of them are very simple things like, for instance, uh, you know having access to, to food and water, uh, you know people having the tools that they need to survive under a broad range of conditions. These are things which. Uh, are definitely part of the resilience conversation. I'd like to make a couple of distinctions actually between um, what I would call the, the, the resilience conversation and the transition movement. And I think it was really interesting to hear you talk earlier about you know the transition movement being uh, a movement which is reaching out to everybody. And uh, that I think is really good. But um, one of the aspects of, of uh, being prepared and, and increasing resilience is about lifeboating. It's about um, getting together with people that you are in community with and discussing uh, what uh, options you have for survival. And there are significant things. You know, we, it, may not, it may be an economic collapse, it may be the effects of climate change, it may be many, many different things. But uh, the, the resilience, well, the great thing about it is that you know, when you can actually focus and concentrate on that, you can really tap into what people really do have in common at a base level. So, I think that resilience and transition are uh, exclusive, they're different, but they can be really complementary. So you can have that outward going conversation which is reaching out to as many people as possible, which you do need to keep positive, which is enrolling people in taking action to improve uh, the community in general. And then you also need to have conversations about resilience, which is about your personal resilience, what you're doing for your health, what you're doing for uh, you know, providing your personal needs and then also your, your immediate community resilience as well. And these, these are really significant things. So, you know, if we don't do that, if we don't take the initiative with actually bringing up a subject which, in, when, there, when there's not an, an immediate emergency and people are reluctant to talk about, I think that, that's a mistake. I just kind of went through living in California um, after the Fukushima accident, and uh, it was a very galvanizing moment for people on the West Coast to know that there was a big radiation cloud on its way. So, uh, people snapped into really talking about this in a, in a really deep way, which uh, was very, very uh, interesting to observe. And it was really great to see that uh, it was pretty much a universal conversation, drawing people from all sorts of different ideologies, very wealthy people, uh, you know, the other end of the spectrum. And uh, it was a bit sad to see in a way after a few weeks that kind of wore off and people went back largely to the cultural trance and business as usual. but. Uh, I think that uh, the more that we can be proactive about resilience, in addition to transition, uh, the better it is. So we had a question. Um, say it again. Well, they've put their hand up and I've, and I've nodded. I've had a couple of hands.